Um, I will tell you, in, in 1988, when I first decided I wanted to do something in policy, I showed up in Rad Byerly's space policy class, which was full of students, maybe, I don't know, 40 students. It was overflow. And I asked Rad, you know, you think you can make room for one more? And Rad said, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> and sent me on my way. Then um, the next year, I showed up in Rad's office. He was at the top of Norland. He, and he had to... Uh, he was the director of what was called a Center for Space and Geosciences Policy, uh, which in many ways was the intellectual uh, predecessor to our center. Um, and I showed up one day, and you know, Rad had his office hours, and he's obviously busy. And I started out the conversation by saying something like, you know, it's obvious that the U.S. needs to replace the space shuttle with a uh, heavy lift booster. He was doing space policy, and I was doing that. He goes, well, why? And I didn't have an answer, so he sent me away at that time, <laughs> too. Um, eventually, though, I, I kept coming back, and Rad let me stay for a while, and then the rest is, is history. And uh, Rad's been a great supporter of our center ever since the very beginning, um, and probably has worked the most at our center for the least compensation. <laughs> so um, it probably had a big influence on all these guys as well. So thanks, Rad. Um, all right, so we have our, our Life After CSTPR panel. Um, and I want you to pay attention to these people. These are a subset of some folks in this room who before long will be running the world. Um, I'm sure of it, so be nice to them. Um, I'm going to introduce them. And I have to say, they all work in Washington. And I, now I have to say things like they're representing themselves and not their agencies <laughs> and all that. Um, and I'll just introduce all three, and then we'll go into it, and they can say whatever they want, and then we'll have a conversation, um, hopefully, about you know, what do you do with expertise in science policy? And if you're a student, and you're in the room, and you think, well, this poli policy at the interface of science and decision-making sounds interesting, but what do I do with it? Um, these guys have pretty interesting careers so far, and it's only going to get better. Um, I'll give you the formal intro bio to these folks, and then I'll just say a little something special about each one. Um, all right, and I think this, we'll just go in the order in the sheet. Genevieve Miracle. Um, is the Environment and Climate Change Policy Advisor in the Policy Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development. She helps coordinate policy prioritization and strategic budgeting for USAID's work on the President's Climate Change Initiative, was USAID's lead coordinator for engagement in the Rio Plus 20 negotiations, and is currently working on the next iteration of the Millennium Development Goals. Genevieve holds a bachelor's in mathematics and environmental science from Northwestern, and a PhD from the University of Colorado, where she conducted her research with the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research. So Genevieve showed up, I don't know when it was, spring of 2002 or, or sometime like that. Um, you know, she was like 12, um, <laughs> kind of a hippie looking kid. And, you know, she shows up and, and she said, you know, I, I've already had an op-ed in the Washington Post and um, I'd like to interview That's you. That's not true. I didn't, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to I didn't interview you to see if you're appropriate for me. <laughs> and I had the, probably the most intensive interview, probably two hours with Genevieve. Um, since comprehensive exams in my PhD, and you know, it took me a couple days to recover. And fortunately for us, Genevieve uh, picked our program to come to. Um, was a fixture at the center. Um, she has a lot of energy, and uh, you'll see that in a second. Um, at the other end of the table is Shally Malaji, who is uh, one of our most recent graduates. Uh, she is right now a visiting fellow with the American Meteorological Society Policy Program. Uh, Shelly holds a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences from the University of Virginia, master's in atmospheric science from Purdue, and she recently completed her PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder Center for Science and Technology Policy Research. So Shelly recently went to Washington, D.C. Um, she was back this summer with her boss, Bill Hook. Is Bill here? Mm -hmm. He's going to be here tomorrow. Um, and I don't know, we got to talking, and you know, I, I haven't been to visit the AMS. And so Shelly said, oh, I'll have you come give a talk. Um, and I said, oh, that's great. And she said, you know, when I get back, I'll set it up. Send me an abstract. So I sent her an abstract, and then she wrote back to me by email and said, said yeah, this is just a little bit too controversial. I'm not going to be able to have host you here. And so for Sally, this is uh, like in The Matrix when Morpheus says to Neo, you know, welcome to the real world. Um, <laughs> Sally's been dropped into an environment that's very different than we have here at the university. But I'll get there, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, Shep Ryan, um, in the middle there. Um, so Shep, I'll, oh, let me read his formal thing. Yeah. Uh, Shep is a senior analyst in the Natural Resources Environment Team of the Government Accountability Office. The GAO is an independent, nonpartisan agency that works for Congress. Often called the Congressional Watchdog, GAO, GAO investigates how the federal government spends taxpayer dollars. 
Prior to joining GAO, Shep worked as a professional staff member of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Science and Technology. Uh, he holds an AB in Astrophysical Sciences from Princeton University, an MS in Environmental Studies from the University of Colorado at Boulder, where he was an affiliate of the, of the Policy Center. Uh, his work and academic research have focused on the interface between science and federal decision making, particularly attempts to gain broader societal benefits from investments in research and development. Now, I'm not sure how I got Chep in our program. I think it was from Dan Sarawis that he sent you our way, um, which was a great idea. But when I first met Chep, he said, and you don't hear this every day from students, he said, he said my dream job is to be a staffer on the House Science Committee. And, <laughs> And I thought, you know, wow, this is a special guy, um, <laughs> having, having been at the House Science Committee where Rad was the, the director. Um, and Shep actually got his dream job uh, upon leaving the center. So for those students who are out there, it's possible. Um, maybe Shep will tell us why his stint in his dream job lasted, what, four years? Um, before he moved on to bigger and better dreams. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Genevieve and let her... Uh, make some remarks, then we'll go to Shelley and then Shep, and then just open it up for a general discussion. Um, so thank you. All right, wow. Um, so I, uh, this, is, this is off the cuff, so I'll <laughs> figure out what I'm gonna say as I go. Um, the, I am probably, I would assume, on this panel, the one who's working right now the least directly on science policy. Um, because, you know, working in, there's, there are certainly science policy issues in what we're doing in development and sort of general prioritization of work in developing countries, but it isn't specifically, I mean, maybe, maybe Chef as well, but it isn't specifically about sort of science policy research. And I, uh, and despite that, I'm amazed at how much I use the kinds of, not only the kinds of sort of way of thinking that I learned here, but the specific issues and way of looking at issues that I, that I sort of did in this, uh, in this space. So I think that, um, I think a part of that is <laughs> about sort of infusing the way that this center thinks about things into all sorts of the work that we do sort of in development. I think as we go forward, so one of the things that Roger mentioned is that I'm sort of working on and thinking about the next iteration of the Millennium Development Goals, which were um, basically turned into a global development agenda that set out for the entire world kind of what we are gonna do with developing countries and how we sort of interface with them. And they have a huge impact on how we think about how we do work as a US government. So when you start thinking about those kinds of things and trying to say what are the, what of the myriad issues that can be included in a global development agenda will we actually put on the table? You have to think about how science, technology, innovation and all of the complications with those issues are going to get sorted out. Um, you have to think about, it's, it's an issue that infuses through pretty much everything that we do and certainly everything that we do in thinking about how to use knowledge. It's far bigger than just sort of what we would, the sort of, I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned when I came here, that how we think about science, technology, and innovation, just as much as how we think about decisions themselves, you, it's a much bigger box than we, than we are used to putting around them. So. Um, it's about knowledge in general and how we think about how we as an individual interface with knowledge, how, I mean, you can see that through all the discussions that have gone on over the course of today. Um, but also how, sort of, how you split knowledge and opinions. This is one of the most fundamental things you can do when you work in politics, right? <laughs> is figure out where knowledge ends and where opinion begins, how to separate those two, but also how to sort of, how you, you want to bring those two things together sometimes. And, um, kind of how to do that most effectively. So I think I learned a huge number of things from being here, and um, I think only a small percentage of them were the things that I could actually put down on a CV <laughs> or the things that I could actually put down in any coherent sort of paragraph describing what my research was about. Um, I think I learned how to think here. Um, ostensibly, I had you know, I tried thinking before I came here, but, um, but I think that there was a, there was a big, you know, when you, when you look at how to, when you step back and look at how you're analyzing problems and how you sort of prioritize what you do, which is so much of what sort of my research ended up being about, um, you have to do way more than looking at the sort of specifics of the funding decisions that you're analyzing. You have to do a lot to actually um, look at whose opinions you include and why you include them. That's so much of what the usable science panel was about. And I think, um, I will say, I studied, it's, it was fascinating going into working at a development agency, never having studied development. Um, it's 
one of the benefits of being a AAAS fellow is that you get to do things like that. But I think, um, I think I was blown away after a few months of looking around and saying, I don't know what's happening here. You know, I think a few months after that, I, I came, I got a little more comfort and I realized that I was just, I really was blown away by just how much what I had done here set me up for working in a completely different zone. But so much of what development success is, is listening and actually sort of appreciating different types of knowledge and the fact that maybe we as the US government don't have the one lease on that type of, on the right type of knowledge. Um, and it's a, it's a community that gets that and this is a community that gets that. And so sort of pairing those two things together I think was, um, I don't know, it was a real treat for me and it made me appreciate so much having come here because I looked at a lot of, a lot of places and a lot of programs thinking about these two issues, science and policy, and how to bring them together. And I think this is, when I did, when I did these apparently two hour long interviews with everybody <laughs> that, I went, that I went to decide where to, where to study, um, it wasn't like this everywhere. It wasn't, it was, there were a lot of places where it was a formula. And this is a place where there is no formula, where fundamentally the message is that there is no formula. That you have to, you have to listen, you have to bring all these sort of different disparate ideas and views of knowledge together and come up with some kind of new solution. So um, honestly, that probably helps me in non-work life too. I don't know. <laughs> um, but but, but uh, I, uh, anyway, I love, I love being here and uh, it's fun to be back because it's fun to remember um, just how much this all shapes the way I approach things now. So, yay. <laughs> Shall we? <clears throat> So if anybody wants to know what happened with the talk that Roger was supposed to give, I am happy to have that conversation. Uh, I will say, though, the discussion here is, um, doesn't actually reflect that scenario, but um, nor do I represent the American Neurological <laughs> Society or the AMS policy program. I am here as an individual speaking about my experience. Um, I will echo a lot of what Genevieve said. This program, I would say, changed my life, and I know that's very cheesy in a way, but um, it probably was the most useful degree I've had and the most useful training I've had as a scientist. And I do deal with these <laughs> issues every day in my work. Uh, I work with the American Meteorological Society in the policy program, and we're a professional scientific organization, and we represent the atmospheric science community. And our job is to do a lot of what you heard about today. It is to, um, to try to enable usable science. It's to try to connect the atmospheric scientists, which maybe many of you are in this group, uh, to decision makers. It's to protect the scientific enterprise. Um, it's to you know, talk about the role of the scientists. And these are all things that we discuss in this program that I went through here that they're not discussing a lot of places elsewhere. And I will say you know, I'm very openly and very humbly that my success in my, my work has largely been my training here. And, um, you know, it's not any special skill set that I have over anyone else. It's the fact that I've had years to think about a lot of these issues, years to hear people who have been thinking about it, to read about it. And so I felt very comfortable to talk about these things, you know, when I, when I went to AMS. And we have, you know, scenarios coming up every day about what is the proper role of a scientific organization? <laughs> what is that line between you know, what you can do as a scientific enterprise, uh, a lot of the issues that we talked about in the last panel, to protect credibility and legitimacy and trust and all those things that science is very unique in having as an enterprise that, um, that we're very proud of that we want to continue going forward. And a lot of, you know, I think this is a really ripe time and it's a perfect time for people who want to get involved in this field because society is becoming more intertwined with science, you know, every day with science and technology, there are going to be more issues every day on these types of things. And so people are well versed to thinking about how to proceed in a way to kind of protect that enterprise and, and be true to the scientists is a really useful thing. And those are the kinds of things, you know, we're talking about every day of what we can and cannot do and what, what is appropriate and, you know, ethical for us and stuff like that. So I was really well equipped for what I do now. Um, and and it's, been a, it's been a real blessing to get this kind of training that, you know, there are other environmental policy programs out there, there are other public policy programs, but there are very, very few science policy programs out there. And this center is well known, uh, Roger's well known, some of the other faculty are well known in DC. I don't have to really explain who I am. It's kind of part of the introduction that other people give 
about me and that door is open for me to discuss things because I came out of a program that has this great reputation for discussing issues that other people aren't discussing. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, um, I want to return to something that Rad said earlier, which is that you know, science policy as a field it doesn't really exist. There's no like science policy track for people who want to go into that field. You don't have to do A and then B and then you get a science policy job. Uh, it's really remarkable the diversity of jobs now that could be called science policy. And I think you see that from the diversity of speakers that have been here today and the diversity of things that people are doing. And so uh, my path towards science policy was actually started in undergrad when I was uh, studying astrophysics and I decided that I was a terrible astrophysicist and mm -hmm. uh, that's quite true. Uh, but I took a class there on uh, the history of NASA and uh, the professor had this I think partially apocryphal story, but basically about uh, an Air Force colonel who had had an outsized role in getting the space shuttle approved and basically backed by the DOD as well as NASA. And it occurred to me that it was kind of fascinating that one person fairly low level would have such a huge impact on, you know, on at the time sort of my field of astrophysics and space science generally. And, so after that, I uh, fell into the clutches of, of Dan Sarowitz and Roger, and they completely brainwashed me from that point <laughs> on. Uh, and it's been a really exciting journey for me. And the thing that I've most been interested in, both going to the Hill and then in my current work, is this very sort of narrow subset of science policy. It's, it's looking at <laughs> sort of the middle managers, if you will. It's, talking about how you s govern programs, federal programs that support science and what the differences are amongst them, what the differences in their goals and uh, outcomes are and you know, how much we know or for the most part don't know about that process. Uh, and you may think that's a strange thing to want to go to the Hill to do because uh, you think of the Hill as being a place where you go to you know, talk about the big issues, climate change and stem cells. and I avoided those as far as I could get away from them. It's, uh, I felt that that just wasn't something my skill set was really attuned to, that I was much more interested in the sort of normal science policy to sort of steal um, a phrase. The center has taught me a lot that has come in very useful in these roles. And a lot of it goes back to actually the policy sciences. Um, and problem orientation and the decision process as just heuristics that help really get a hold of the problem that you're looking at and make you question what exactly are your goals, what are the goals of the other parties that you're working with. And particularly, you can imagine on the Hill, that's an important thing to have in mind. Uh, and then also, where are you in the process? What can you actually change at this point? Has the decision been made and you're still arguing about it? Um, or is there actually somewhere that you can get leverage? And the center is a great place to really learn how important context is because we talk about so many different fields. We get speakers from so many different you know, universities, different backgrounds, both academics, practitioners, et cetera. <laughs> and it's important to sort of understand that there's no one right answer and this was a great place to both learn that and understand how various people go about making those determinations. And so, um, yeah, it's wonderful that the center has had 10 very productive years and hopefully there'll be another 100 productive years, but not too productive because I don't want too many people competing against me for jobs. <laughs> um, All right, let me, uh, before we open it up for, for uh, questions, and I'm gonna ask the first one, let me tell you about a few of the folks who uh, we, we contacted to perhaps be on this panel. Not that these guys are our last choices or anything, but to show up, I mean, these guys all work in DC, and um, not to give you the impression that, all right, you get a science policy degree or training, and then you go to Washington. It's, there, there's a lot you can do, and I, I agree with Shep, actually, and Rad, that science policy is not of a thing. Um, so here's a few people. So, so these are a few of our alums who couldn't be here today. Um, Edward von Herberstein um, was one of our early grads. He worked for Goldman Sachs in London. 
Um, one day we will be the Von Herberstein Center for Science, <laughs> Technology, <laughs> Policy. But he studied um, catastrophe modeling and started working with the, uh, the reinsurance industry. And um, Didn't he study skiing? He studied, I don't know when he slept, he skied. <laughs> when he was here, he took like five classes a semester and ski 80 days a year, something. Speaking of which, um, Joel Gratz <laughs> yeah. um, is a weather entrepreneur, um, meteorologist who came through our program um, and uh, had a great job kind of following the footsteps of uh, Edward. They worked together um, and Joel decided that he did not want to go to London and work in global reinsurance, become a multimillionaire. Um, but wanted to start his own company, and uh, he's doing pretty good with opensnow.com here in Boulder. Um, Eric Fisher is a professor at Arizona State University, and he studies uh, the choices scientists make in their laboratories um, from the standpoint of ethical and social and policy perspectives. Um, why do scientists make the choices they do and with what consequences? Um, and Adam Briggle, who is a professor at the University of North Te Texas, um, where he studies ethics, and in particular bioethics, um, and the the, the choices that we make in bringing philosophy to bear upon decisions on science and technology. Um, so let me ask you guys the first question. Um, not a week goes by when a student comes uh, into my office and says, you know, I'm, I'm in the physical sciences, I'm in biology, I'm in astrophysics, I'm in this, that, and the other thing, and I'm really interested in policy. Right? And some of them are late undergrads, some of them are grad students, some of them are postdocs. Um, and it's, it's a familiar story here. But so based on your experience, you know, getting your education, but then going out in the real world, um, what advice would you give to these students who say, I want to I wanna make a turn um, from a research, from a bench research career to something to do with decision making and policy? Um, what would you do? And what, you know, what should we be doing to support them maybe differently than what you guys want? So. So one just this is, I don't know why this is my first gut reaction to this because there's a lot of different ways you could go with that question. But um, I think that this, this question absolutely comes up millions of times. And I think, you know, through my, I haven't worked for AMS, but I've certainly gone to lots of American Meteorological Society conferences. And I know that there are, this is a question that is always on the table. And the students that come, and there's a lot of students that come, continually ask this question. And I think that the hesitation is often, I don't want to go down a road of being in an inter interdisciplinary department or doing something that is very interdisciplinary, but I'm interested in those kinds of <coughs> ideas. Because if, you, if I go down that road, that makes me unemployable in my science or potentially even in policy. And I think we are sort of in this funny stage in life where um, both academically and I think also sort of just in the hiring world that um, everybody appreciates and values interdisciplinarity and integration, but nobody really knows what it is. Um, that comes up, you know, a zillion, and obviously we know what it is in terms of like bringing different disciplines together, but <laughs> I don't think we necessarily know what it is in terms of how do you evaluate that? How do you find positions for that? And I think that's a big fear among people that are sort of coming and asking the question, how do I get into this policy stuff? And I would say that um, my, my answer myself but also my answer to the people that I talk to about this is um, not to fear what happens if you throw yourself into it. Not to just sort of dabble in it and read as, I mean, reading as much as you can is great, but if you can actually sort of commit to something that, that pushes you further into it, that pushes you to actually question how you think and the kinds of assumptions that Carl sort of put on the table that he's sort of putting out there in the last panel, I think that's necessary because it's not just mastering or bringing in a new set of ideas that you, have to, that you have to sort of tick off so that you know policy. You have to push yourself to think differently and to question your assumptions differently. And so I think, I mean, I guess my answer was always, if this makes me less employable in that specific scientific field that I'm interested in, for me it was atmospheric science, then I don't want that job. <laughs> because ultimately I'm not gonna wanna do what that job asks me to do. I wanna be in those jobs that ask for you to think interdisciplinarily and to question your assumptions and do that kind of thing. And I believe that those kinds of jobs are just proliferating out there now. So I don't think there's any, any risk in it, honestly. As much as people still believe that there is risk, I don't think that there is. So push yourself and don't fear, don't fear interdisciplinarity, even if we don't know what it means. And, and, and <laughs> do you like your job? I love my job. <laughs> I do, I really love my job. And I love that, I love it for these reasons. I love it because um, I do think that, um, when you're talking about 
actual sort of problems that people are facing, they cross boundaries. You know? So asking ourselves to cross those boundaries in our training makes sense. And I like that, I like that my job asked me to do that. I would just add that I think you can, it depends a lot on what the student means of, about being interested in policy. And um, a lot of times <laughs> they won't know yet. And I think I've met a lot of students who are going the policy route because they don't like their PhD advisor. And uh, that's sort of their only answer. Uh, that's not necessarily a great reason to go into it, especially if their passion is still about that field um, and that they are, you know, are interested in policy because they see it as a sort of an add-on. And it really is a significant skill set to sort of learn the policy portion and stay abreast of a particular field. And I think very, very few people can successfully do both. Um, to be an expert in a scientific discipline and an expert in the policy of that discipline. Uh, so there's a, there is a real choice here in do you want to do sort of science policy or do you want to do the science that you started with? And so it's not a decision that should be taken lightly. Um, so and as far as serving those students, I think it's important to early on, and that's one of the things the center has done well, is early on you give people a taste of exactly how complex a milieu they're stepping into. Yeah, I actually, you know, if I heard more students saying that, I think that's great. I think that is really a good sign because to me that means, you know, students that are in physical sciences or natural sciences are, are wanting to be more relevant or useful to society. I think that's a great thing. Um, Not that useful business again. Well, <laughs> Carl, we can talk about, you know, <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a deeper concept, yes, but um, I think that's a, I would encourage that. I, you know, I think that that's something that, you know, you want to fulfill some greater need, you know, through your science. I do uh, caution, though, that uh, I think there are productive versus problematic ways of doing that, and so a program like this uh, where you can really explore some of those issues and think about uh, how to proceed in ways that are, you know, useful to the science and things like that. Those are really helpful to do because, you know, we see plenty of people, I see plenty of people in D.C. that are scientists that want to get involved and, you know, the intent is always a good one, but the way they proceed can be really problematic to science as an enterprise or crossing that line between science and advocacy. Um, those cause problems that then, you know, that make bigger issues that you know we're trying to undo. So there are, I would, there's not really right and wrong, but there are productive ways of proceeding with that versus problematic ways. And you know, until you really explore those ideas and talk to people in the field and then experience some of it, you know, yourself, and then sort of see how it plays out, um, I, I would caution to just kind of delving into it, just you know, because the the enthusiasm is there. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to be Phil Donahue, I guess. Take questions. There's. I'll be Oprah. Oprah's retired. Isn't it? I think Phil Donnie might have too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see, I don't know. I about don't know for sure. All right, Carl has his hand up. All this talk about useful science. Again. <laughs> uh, thanks to all three of you. Um, I, I, I have to say, from the rather than what's what happens life after, life before, I experienced all three of these people in uh, a class that I occasionally teach here. Were you all in the same class? No. Same, the, the, but, but uh, I had the best students that I've ever had as graduate students here at CSTPR. And uh, these are, these are three, <laughs> three of them. Uh, so thanks for coming back and sharing your, uh, your experience. Uh, Shep's comment that it's difficult to be an expert in a science and then in the policy of that science. Made me want to ask all three of you, do you think there's a, a plus or a minus in trying to do policy related to a science that you already know? I mean, uh, Shali, you, your, your degree was in meteorology, um, so you're working in meteorology policy. Uh, Sheps, yours wasn't, you're not doing policy related to what your astrophysics was. Uh, uh, Genevieve, what, 
there's, there's not any, you're not doing science policy now, you said, so <laughs> it doesn't fit. But right. I'd just be interested to know whether you think there's a plus or a minus from having a degree in science, then working in the policy related to that science, or not. So uh, for a time I did, because I, when I was on the Hill, I worked for the space subcommittee. And so having a astrophysics background uh, was very helpful in a very utilitarian manner in that people didn't perceive me as a threat because they assumed I had had the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, and, you know, that actually is, it can be useful to, you know, have a signifier that lets you into a community and that maybe lets them talk to you more openly, but it's also can be dangerous in that people see you as, you know, a turncoat if you then are not supporting huge increases for the NASA budget. Um, I think the, the more difficult <laughs> problem, though, is just one of, you know, we're cognitive misers. You have to pick and choose what you're going to focus on. And to the extent that you are really in the weeds on a discipline, a particular field, you're also going to be in the weeds on how that field sort of sees the universe. And then if you're then trying to apply that to a field as broad as science policy, where you're taking an astrophysics background and then also trying to like talk about medical science, you're going quickly cross into areas that may not be helped by that uh, discipline. Uh, yeah, I found it extremely useful, and um, and it comes up all the time. I will say that you know uh, because I, in my role, I'm representing the atmospheric science community. But to do something outside of the atmospheric scientist, so the first thing I get is pushback when I go in because I'm considered an outsider. You know, and and in fact, I was just at a um, big meeting last month. You know, well, are you a meteorologist? I say, yeah, I am one. Oh, what kind of meteorologist? Oh, I'm a boundary layer meteorologist. Well, what'd you do? And you know, I can speak the I can talk the talk and, and, you know, I know the same things they do. And so that actually, the purpose of that for me is that they welcome me into the community then. And, okay, you are one of us. Um, what it does for my actual work, I think, is probably a little less useful. I mean, I know the sciences, but um, it helps me, I guess, a little bit to kind of see the, the broader spectrum. But really for me, it was, first of all, it was good for my own comfort level because when you go from the physical and natural sciences to policy sciences, you know, there could be that personal discomfort of, hey, I'm out of my realm. This is not really my expertise. So there's a comfort I had in being housed in something I did know, though, when I first started. Because, you, you know, I know the atmospheric sciences, so I can kind of extend that out. Now that I'm kind of past that point, um, I'm comfortable in, in science policy. It really is that the community accepts me as one of them. And, you know, and my job is to be a liaison. And so, the policy people, you know, they're okay with me, but it really is tough to gain, you know, the, the trust of the scientists. So I've, I found that really helpful. So um, I, I agree with both Shelley and Shep. I think there's a big perception issue here, sort of a, a perception of your credentials in some ways. And if you come in just, at, just as a policy scientist, it's often not enough in, in the eyes of the people that you're sort of working with. So I do think that's that's an issue. That's not always the case, but I definitely think that's an issue. I also agree with something Shep said that I think functionally it's very valuable in terms of not understanding the science itself, because that j tends not to come up when you're looking at prioritization of what's a fund. It's more about understanding the culture of science, right? Because there is a culture of science, and there is, I mean, just the way that both Shep and Shelley phrased that, <laughs> it was very much a, I am accepted by the community. There is a community and to understand a science. And I honestly think it is much so, I studied atmospheric science and I guess math a little bit, but mostly atmospheric science. And then those, that was the community that I was studying how climate science is funded, you know. But then sort of moving on to, I think one of my dissertation chapters was on nanotechnology. I know nothing about the nanotechnology field and yet sort of understanding a science and therefore the culture around it, while I understand completely that nanoscience is very different than climate science and how it organizes. It enables you to look at how it's organized and to know even what categories to sort of look for in how a different science would be organized. So I think in some ways what we're doing here is becoming experts in that nexus. And you don't need to necessarily know the science that you're studying 
in a, in a very deep way in order to be able to comment on it and look for the organization of it. But it's very difficult to start this whole endeavor without understanding science as a culture, as a community, and as a discipline. And so maybe it's possible to do it without having started out as a scientist, but you just have to be very deliberate about knowing those sort of three things. Let me give a quick example of an area where uh, the discipline can have a, a real impact on the policy, and that's looking at patents. And specifically, if you were interested in intellectual property and patents and come from a biomedical background where you're interested in drug development versus you're coming from Silicon Valley and you're interested in you know, software development, you're going to have really different responses to what the appropriate scale of patenting and copyright should be because those industries are so fundamentally different as far as their time scales. Um, so that's one place where I think being able to try and be a generalist is really important. And if I could just add one more thing to what Genevieve said that I think is so important. Um, you know, we always talk, at least in my office, that you will rarely find a public <laughs> policy specialist that tries to learn the science, but it's a lot easier for a scientist to try to learn the policy side of it. And so knowing that, anybody who I think is a scientist that wants to get involved in the policy realm, you know, bravo to you. It's going to be easier for you, and you'll probably be able to do it pretty well because, like Genevieve said, you understand the culture already of the tough part. You can understand the policy sciences and kind of see how that plays out a little bit easier than a political scientist is going to try to learn geology or something like that. This must be the kind of discussion that Russian spies have when they go back to the KGB and talk about being, being moles. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I'm currently in the um, CSTP program. I'm, I'm really enjoying it, and I feel like it's turning my life around. But I specifically have questions um, to Genevieve and Shep about how you ended up actually going directly from the program. Genevieve, you went to the AAAS program, which is a very competitive fellowship, and some of us also consider very prestigious, and I'm curious as to how that shaped your, the rest of your career from that experience. And I'm also curious as to how you applied to that fellowship because there's a variety of routes of going into that fellowship. And then Shep, the idea that you went directly from the program into, you know, advising um, on the Hill is um, really impressive. And I'm wondering what you feel like you had that enabled you to kind of get your dream position right off the bat. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take on the AAAS. So I did, um, I did a postdoc and then I did the AAAS program to come into DC and that is, um, you know, often when people come and ask me actually how to get jobs at AID, it is, there is a, there's definitely a USA Jobs series of listings sometimes, but often it is through fellowship programs of different kinds. So whether it's AAAS or the Presidential Management Fellowship or Global Health ones, um, it tends to be fellowships. That's a big, a big sort of way in. So the AAAS program, I presume in this audience that you guys know what it stands for, but I'm going to say anyway just in case, the American Association for the Advancement of Science <laughs> Fellowship Program, they have sort of a series of, um, a series of different kinds of fellowships. So there are the sort of, the large majority of them are in the executive branch, and then there's also the congressional fellowships. Um, and the executive branch ones are the ones that, that's the one that I did, and it's, a, it's one to two years sort of your preference. Um, and then uh, the, the Hill ones are a year. Um, I, there are a few different tracks. There's sort of the international, I don't even know what it's called now, it's like uh, DSD is one. Is one. I, we can tell you later if you're interested in what it actually is. But the international track, there's sort of the environment track, the health track, and I'm certain that I'm missing something else. But, um, but I uh, applied, you can apply for two. I applied for the international track, and um, it was, I think it, this has changed a lot. Um, they are still very much, it's very diverse in the kinds of people that they, um, that they grant uh, fellowships to. Um, so it used to be that it was very difficult as, I think, a social scientist or probably even more so a policy scientist to get these sorts of positions because it looked like it was sort of wasting a position on somebody who already understood policy. I think that's changed a lot recently. Um, and it's a, um, you know, I think that being interested and sort of engaged in these kinds of questions about policy already has a, um, helps a lot. 
Um, I can certainly, we can certainly talk more about the specifics of applying to the program, but, um, but I think that that's just to, to sort of show that interest and commitment in it, it's what you will ultimately kind of be doing. So if you already are interested, it helps a lot, I think, in terms of, of getting the position. Now, um, it, for me, I, I started through the fellowship. It is a fascinating experience because when you, when you first start, I was honestly a little bit skeptical. I, should, I should, probably should admit this on stage, but uh, I was a little bit skeptical of sometimes how AAAS, it, I, thought, I saw it as an advocacy organization for more science funding. And so I, um, I wasn't sure what the, how the program would be. I'd certainly heard good things, but I, I had doubts at times. Those doubts were blown, I mean, they do not exist after I actually experienced the program because it has sort of <laughs> been there enough and built up this credibility that you walk in as a this starry eyed fellow or finalist, you aren't a fellow yet until you find an office, and, um, and you sit down at these, in these offices of people that at best you studied and wished that you could have a chance to meet with them, and they're sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, I'd like you to come work with me. I looked at your CV for a second. Be great. You came and worked here. And you're like, what? Like, this is not happening. And you can have 20 to 50 interviews of that kind. You wouldn't have that many. But still, it's impressive that that's, that that's there. And then people do often stay on. A lot of people do go back to academia, but it, you have the sort of potential to stay on and be hired on afterwards. So I, I don't know if that at all spoke to what you were wondering, but that was my experience. <laughs> Does that... <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I've been at, at USAID for three years, and um, two of the years were fellowship years, and then I, um, I sort of knew from the outset, well, pretty early in, that I had gotten the development bug and I wanted to stay. Um, I just was talking to my bosses, and they, um, a lot of agencies, and definitely, I, I can't, I guess, speak for the other agencies, but USAID is really trying to build up its science and technology capacity, so there's a, a real desire to kind of to hire on fellows where possible. Um, some, there's money constraints, but I was in a bureau that was new, and that's nice because that means that they're hiring new people. Um, and I also just find that you make, you make so many connections when you're there to so many different parts of the agency because the nature of it is not heads down burrow. The nature of any job of this sort is that you're interacting with so many people. And so there's often opportunities. And they may not necessarily be in the agency. You can work, DC is this, you know, weird world where <laughs> you can still work on the same issue, but outside of, outside of the US government. And um, I don't know, the universe is much bigger than you realize when you first get there, <laughs> I think. So. Yep. So for me, the, the short story is basically I, I was very lucky. Um, but what led up to and that. so good it is thinking job. <laughs> what led up to that was I volunteered and worked as an unpaid intern one summer um, and worked actually with quite a number of uh, former AAAS fellows. So I, I think if you're really interested in being a Hill staffer, uh, the easiest route to, uh, is, at least by numbers, seems to be AAAS fellow. Uh, but anyway, I, I was able to you know take some time off, continue to rack up my student loans, and uh, spent a few months over a summer working for free for the committee, and they offered me a job at the end of that. Uh, there's actually another person who was at the committee um, also started on the Hill as an intern and then came here to CSTPR and now went back to DC, works for uh, Senator Mark Udall, uh, Jimmy Haig. So we have a couple of, of Hill um, alumni now. And I think for both of us, it, and for a lot of people, getting on the Hill is you kind of have to kick your way in the bottom door and work your way up. Um, but internships are just as a matter of course, it's similar to a fellowship, you're there and you're talking to people and you are a face and a name and a mind and people with, and somebody with ideas. So it's a lot more than just a CV that mm -hmm. lands on their desk that they're likely to overlook. Okay. So. Um, hi, um, I guess it's my turn for the mic. This question may not be limited to the three panelists up on stage, but maybe anyone who's participated today. A lot of the discussion has been um, at the academic and federal, national, international level today. I wonder if anyone would have any observations or ideas about how these concepts would be applied at the local or municipal level. I, I think that's a great question. And I would say when I started um, in this program a lot, I think 
I don't know, maybe 75% of the people in our program, if not more than that, were master students. And actually, I think a lot of them ended up working very much at the, um, at the local level. I think, you know, working on climate stuff, I think some of the most interesting things that are happening are not at all at the national level, but are very much at the city level, um, at the regional level, and at the state level. Um, so I think that we may have been sort of talking very much at this sort of about federal policy, but I would say that in my experience, every one of these concepts gets de can easily be extended down into those sort of local levels. I think honestly, sometimes even better. I think Betts could probably speak to this pretty well, and certainly the whole sort of usable science panel could speak to this well, but um, so much of the sort of looking at knowledge differently that I kind of mentioned early on, um, happens best when you're doing some of that stakeholder engagement, actual conversations with the knowledge users, and that, that tends not, I mean, it can happen, and I guess it did in my research, so I don't know why I'm negating that, but it can happen at the federal level, but I think it, it very, the successes are often seen when you're at that sort of, you can affect decisions at a local level. And particularly if you have an interest in like mm -hmm. innovation policy and uh, there's a lot of action by states and municipalities and you know, trying to, to promote innovation, small business, entrepreneurship in uh, science in their states, in their districts. And that's a wonderful place to work because you really have a lot of freedom to experiment and try new things. And it's an area where we, we really don't know all that much about how science leads to innovation and how to cross the valley of death. That's a, we sort of know there's a valley of death and anything beyond that is still uncharted terrain. Um, yeah, I just want to respond to that too. And if, if you, if you uh, stop thinking about um, uh, policy as a concrete outcome, but rather as a, as a process and an, as a way of problem solving and thinking about uh, problems. Um, I use these techniques, these heuristics uh, in a lot of my dealings locally in the research I do, but even within my university. And um, I tell you, you can become really popular when you go to university meetings um, and they're desperately trying to solve something and you ask, well, what's the problem? <laughs> um, and then they ignore you and <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep doing what they were doing because they weren't sure what the problem was. But, um, but, but really, it's like we, we get a skill set coming out of here in addition to an intellectual body of knowledge. Um, and you know, for me, I think the, you know, the, the, the heuristics and the, the skill set was, was one of the biggest takeaways. But there's no limit at the scale at which you can use this, uh, use these uh, skills and this knowledge. Jason. So acknowledging that there's no uh, substitute for on-the-job training, what do you wish you had learned in the program that it didn't provide? What's something that either a skill or an experience that you have needed that you could imagine that a graduate program could have provided that was missing? For me, it was definitely more experience uh, remembering names and talking face to face with new groups of people uh, and having to do you know your your thirty second overview, your five minute, your thirty minute. Um, all of that interaction is stuff that I really ended up learning on the job. Um, I remember we had one guest speaker come in when I was a student who was at the EPA and said, you know, I read The Honest Broker, which is Roger's book, and it all made sense to me theoretically. I thought I understood it. And then I had this experience, and it went completely differently than I thought. And I heard her experience, and I thought, wow, I would have thought the same thing she did at the beginning of the story. And, you know, and her point was, it's so clear, you know, when we study this stuff in class and that on the job training is a lot of, you know, all the gray area of it. But that was just so impressionable to me because I walked in, you know, to my job realizing that it's not going to be as black and white as what I understood as a student. And it's not. I mean, everything is just shades of gray there. And I remember her experience and being, this is where I tripped up. This is what I thought I understood. This is where it went, you know, wrong. 
that was really useful. And had we had more of them, I don't know if that would have been even more impressionable, but I do remember that specific of all the years I was here, that definitely, you know, was set in my mind, like, okay, this is, it's not going to be that way. And, you know, and it's not. I mean, every day is very kind of gray, and you have to navigate through that. Um, I think that, I mean, it would have been great to, if I'd studied more development, but that's not really the question. Um, so I think, uh, I think the, the one thing that, I mean, I guess this kind of gets into on-the-job training, but I'm, actually I don't, it doesn't. Um, I think that have, we do, a, there's some really interesting case studies that we have had done in the classes um, here that, that really kind of bring putting this, to taking these conceptual things and making them actually, you know, practicable, um, whatever, that's probably a word, um, is uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of those case studies that are very valuable and, they, and fun, but I think making them not just case studies, making them actually, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the working with communities thing, and I, I mean, there is a fear that, you know, the communities in Denver would get kind of overwhelmed if, like, every class <laughs> has to go out and, like, talk to them and listen, but I, but I do think having more of that kind of thing would be extremely valuable because... We talk about its value all the time, and I don't know that I really, I still um, haven't gotten that quite as much as I would like.